that was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted, and you yourself a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When the old man Simeon announced to the virgin, that a sword was going to pierce her soul. I don't know if Simeon had seen, it had been revealed to him by God, to this old man, the scene of Christ crucified, and the virgin at the foot of the cross. Neither I know, I rather think not, that the virgin intuited that terrible end. Nevertheless, this warning, this prophecy, was enough for our mother to know that, at some point, using colloquial terms, Things were going to end badly. Perhaps she thought it was her flight to Egypt and the persecution by Herod was the moment, because there were certainly the sword of pain pierced their heart. The fear that something would be done to her child. Then came the sweet and long stage of family life in Nazareth. It didn't seem like there was any particular surprises there. Therefore, the virgin knew that terrible moment had not yet arrived. When Jesus begins his public life, they begin to arrive at the village of Nazareth. While the virgin lived there, all kinds of rumors began to come. The rumors of the villages, of the small towns. In Spain, we say, small town, big hell. Gossip. Things that are transmitted by word of mouth and their arrived distorted, sometimes completely changed. Without a doubt, the news came about his frame, his success to the people who followed him, the miracles he performed, but also that he was making powerful enemies, that more than once they had tried to kill him, and this anguish, this worry, was a sword of pain, but it was not yet the final one. When Jesus called her, she would not have been able to be at the foot of the cross on Good Friday if she had not arrived in Jerusalem much earlier, because it was not a matter of taking a plane, there was not such a thing. At least, a few days of walking. A tired walk, consider the age of the virgin, was necessary. When Jesus called her, Mother, I need you, come to me. The virgin knew that the time had come. She knew through that intuition that her mothers have, and she knew it because her son had never asked her for anything like that. Requesting her to be by his side meant that he needed her for that definitive moment. How did the Virgin Mary prepare herself for that moment of the cross? Without a doubt, when they saw each other before Good Friday, possibly in Bethany, where Jesus lived in Lazarus, Martha, and Mary's house, they undoubtedly had some time to talk, to vent to each other's feelings. I am convinced that there, Jesus told her what he had said so many times to his apostles, and they had not believed him. Mother, I am going to die, and it is going to be extremely hard, but I am going to resurrect. Message of pain and message of hope. Surely he told her, I made you come, and it is going to be very hard for you to see. I made you come because I need you. I will need your presence. I will need your faith. I will need your support. Maybe he told her an anecdote from when they were little children, from when he was a child. Maybe he told her, Remember when you carried me in your arms. When I fell that day and got a scratch, you healed me. Or when you simply were simply with me in the difficult times, it will be the same now. You will see me suffer, and that is why I will need you in a way that you cannot understand. But I will need you by my side. I will need your presence, your unbreakable love, and your faith in God and in me. 
that the tragedy came. The virgin did not see the flagellation in the praetorium, but she found him on the way to Calvary. She saw him destroyed. The mother sees his tortured son. I don't think it takes much imagination to realize what that meant. A mother, any mother, would have been devastated when she saw what a mess her son had been turned into. Then the final, final hour arrived, the hour of the death. She was there. She was like a mother who sees her child suffer and she can't do anything to help him like a mother who would very gladly exchange herself for her son, and who says to God, Take that suffering away from him and give it to me. Take that cancer from him and give it to me. Take that problem away from him and give it to me. A mother who sacrifices herself for her son. I don't know if this thought, so common, so human, so fruit of love, was in Mary while she was at the foot of the cross. Possibly yes. What I don't know is what the, she was aware that her son needed her, and that if her son's time had come, the mother's time also had come. When she heard Jesus say, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? She understood why her son had called her. She understood that there was some mystery an unfathomable mystery for her, incomprehensible to her, but that she had to be there giving him support. For him to see her without collapsing, without screaming in despair, and offering to God in silence, so that her son could see her and understand the words she said to the angel Gabriel when she appeared to her in Nazareth thirty-three years earlier. Here is the slave, here is the servant, let it be done to me according to your word. I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand, but I trust. Mary, at the foot of the cross, is the fiat. The fiat of the beginning and the fiat of the end. Her fiat. Her I trust. Her I trust you, which Jesus repeats with her last words, making now his own. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. I trust you. I believe that this is the example that Mary gives us to all of us who suffer from the beginning from the suffering of others. We try to solve their problems. We try to help them and we feel limited. We don't have enough money to end the hunger in the world. Catastrophes. Catastrophes of an earthquake overflow us. The person we love the most is suffering, perhaps even through their fault or a devastating disease is taking that person away, a loved one. What can we do? Like Mary, don't lose faith, don't lose hope. Support him so that he does not stop looking at heaven, so that he looks at heaven again, if it for most his life he has been looking only at the earth, for him to turn again to God, perhaps as he was a child. For most of his life, he has slipped separated from God and away from him. Mary at the foot of the cross, she is corredemptrix, not in the same the sense that she redeems us, only Christ is the Redeemer, but she's a collaborator of the redemption, a collaborator. The same as when St. Paul says, I complete in my flesh what is lacking in the passion of Christ. It would not mean that St. Paul thought that Christ was not the only Redeemer. It means that we can collaborate with God and that God has wanted man's collaboration. Mary was the collaborator in the redemption, offering her suffering, accepting her suffering and helping her son lean on her to continue saying without understanding it at the moment of the kinesis of abandonment, at the moment when reason becomes blind and we can no longer see anything. In the moment of absolute darkness, at that moment, leaning on his mother, he was able to say, My God, I trust in you. Into your hands I command my spirit. Let us do that. When we are next to someone who suffers, when we cannot do anything else to help him, let us give the, our testimony of faith 
of trust, also for our presence by his side. Amen.